Um, I mentioned, you know, I'd gone uh, gone to Kosovo. I'd been gone on a trip there, and then came back through uh, London for, with Alan Marshall for his family camp there, and home one day, went to Montana for that camp. It all kind of jumbles together in my head sometimes. Uh, but just, you know, a quick update on Kosovo. You know, one of my long-term contacts, you guys know Java Duraco. He's been here three or four times. Actually, Esperina was here once, way back when, on his first trip here, I think. Esperina is the one whose daughter, they suspect, has uh, muscular dystrophy. And she's been tested in Istanbul, and <clears throat> for the most part, you know, that's the verdict, and uh, I had, uh, oh, what's it, uh, what's the place in Grand Rapids? The Helen DeVos Children's Hospital. I sent them the medical records, and they basically confirmed that what Istanbul did was what they would do. There's only one more final test at the chromosome level, apparently, that I guess there's many kinds or, of dystrophy, and the chromosome test would tell them exactly which one, but it, it's not good no matter which one it is. And some, you know, is fatal. Uh, you can't breathe. Those muscles quit, and then you, you suffocate. And she's nine, no, seven. She's seven years old. It's a heartbreaker. Um, but, you know, I wanted to get a chance to talk to Esperina because here's the deal. Like with any grieving, there's going to be those phases. There's going to be some denial, some anger. There's going to be a whole bunch of things before acceptance finally settles in. So you have to be patient sometimes when you're working with people, you know, they just don't want it to be that way. If you've ever had to go through something like that, you just don't want it to be that way. But reality sets in eventually in people's lives, and it's what it is. Well, then does that mean no hope now? No hope. Go jump off a bridge. Life goes on. We have to deal with it. But there is hope. The God of hope can fill us with all joy and peace in believing. We can abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul says in Romans 15, 13. That was written to people going through some tough times in the first century. It hasn't changed much. So I was able to sit with her, I wanted to, privately and start to talk with her about this situation. She listened. She doesn't want it to be that way, but I said, you know, you got to understand, Esperina, you know, God allows for the darkness in the world because the light is greater. And sometimes in these times when we, we just can't see no hope here in the flesh anywhere, we have to look up. I said, everything Leva is, is still fine. Because she's just inside a body that possibly is beginning to break down. Like all of us. Hello. <laughs> the old body will break down some sooner than others. Things that happen to the body cannot affect the spirit of the man that's in him. So anyway, I wanted to be able to do that. That happened. I'm glad for that. I'm not saying she just got all excited and they just accepted all that, but you got to start slow. <clears throat> start to get those things introduced into the old brain housing group so the processes can begin. Because we're all made for this, and so is she. She is, is no different than anybody. Look, somebody's child is going to have muscular dystrophy. Somebody's child is going to have spinal bifida. Somebody's child is going to be born mentally retarded or something. And if you weren't made that way, born that way, you could end up that way in a heartbeat. Things happen. 
walking one day, not the next day, because accidents happen. You know, there's a cute little baby born out there to Montana that, uh, you know, was born without legs. <clears throat> Yowzers. I mean, wow. And God's like, what, you got a problem with that? Uh, I don't want to fall in that same trap Job did, you know, thinking, hey, can we talk about this? I mean, I, I just would really like to discuss all this. God says, all right, stand up. Gird yourself like a man. You want to talk? Let's talk. Where were you when I laid the foundation for the earth? Where were you when I told the ocean, you'll come no further? I set the bars for that. Where were you when, uh, okay, Job said, okay, what was I thinking? Uh, I'm just dust. I'm just dust. God's got such a bigger picture, it would be pointless to start to question in him, why did he make me this way? So, that bigger picture stuff's for all people for all time. The message of the gospel is 2,000 years old, but it started all the way back in the very beginning. From the very third verse of the Bible, let there be light. That light is not the sun and the moon. That light of day one where he called the, the light day and the darkness night, evening and morning, first day, it's the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that would be shining in the face of Jesus Christ coming to a theater near you. How do we know that? Because the Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us that is what the let there be light is all about. It's about the glory of God. And it would be revealed in the face of Jesus Christ in the fullness of time. Third verse of the whole Bible. God sure takes his good sweet time in getting there. But I'm not going to find fault with the potter. I'm the clay. And I will not reply to the Father in that way. So... I had the chance to study with Avni and his boys. Uh, they're all immersed now. As you know, well, Avni was immersed here. Um, you know, Avni got real sick, you know, from before he about died. They had to cut his insides out of him and put them all back in there and try to plug things back where they go. And, but he's had to take some of these treatments. He refers to them as like chemo treatments. He has to take them for the next six months. They're really kind of expensive. Uh, I said, I'll make a deal with you. I want you to translate all of Jay Wilson's books into Albanian, and I'll cover your cost of your treatments. He said, it's a deal, Stevie. <laughs> Avni Sharp, he reads law books for fun. He consumed. I can't imagine anything more boring than reading big volumes of law. Easy. But he does. And he got him a new job. He's back. He's a professor again of law. Man, he grasped. And he grasped the English language. All his books are in English. And his sons speak English, Florin and Adrian. So that's what they're going to do. They're going to translate all those books into Albanian and we'll get them printed and published because I think God is doing something in Kosovo. The gospel is going to go forward from there. Um, some of you know that, uh, that one of the things that, we, that I first wanted to really try to do was to reach a population in there that had no hope in Kosovo after the war. And that population is 23,000 women that were assaulted by Serbian paramilitaries and mercenaries as a weapon of war. Gang things before the families to defile these women, young and old. That population is hidden. It's taboo to speak about it. Many women, because they were thrown out of their homes after that by their families, by their husbands, cast out. Uh, it wasn't no fault of their own. 23,000 is what the UN says. There were people that went there to try to help after that. Many of those women just simply committed suicide. <clears throat> 
I knew they existed, but it's hard to find a secret society because some of those women, it's not known that it happened to them. Some of them got married because they never told anybody. And now they fear if their husband finds out, he will kill them. So it just gets worse. Uh, Benny, the guy that mows the lawn here, was trying to help with that because he has his cousin, Valora, that is involved. But as she got cold feet, you know, she was going to be one to help us to maybe get into this society to try to... There's only one thing on the face of this planet powerful enough to take somebody that has been through that or saw their family shot, murdered in front of their eyes, to get those images out of their head, it has to be overridden by something way more powerful than that. And if you can think of something more powerful than that, just in the physical, what is seen on the earth, good luck with that. Good luck with that. What are you going to drive those images out with? Some psycho babble? Go see a counselor? They can only tell you what to try to deal with in an outward sense. We need a much bigger picture set before our powerful minds. You know, God allows for the darkness because the light is greater. I don't know how many times I've said that. I'll probably say it a million more times till we get it. It's not easy to go on that journey. It's not easy. But you know, that information you won't find anywhere but in Scripture. You know, you can know... God exists by reason, experience, and observation because the Bible tells us so. By the things that are made, his eternal power and Godhead are clearly seen by the things that are made so the people are without excuse. Okay, so we can know that God exists. Guess what? You still don't know God. According to Acts 17, the Apostle Paul was at Mars Hill in Athens, Greece, walking through, beholding all their devotion, saw this one altar to the unknown God, and he said, that one there, I'll declare to you. And he began to unpackage this unknown God. So people know that there's well, something out there. They would believe that. This couldn't have happened by itself. Okay, good for you. You know, because it's the fool that says in his heart, there is no God. He's a fool, all right. But you can't know God except by revelation. It has to be revealed. That which was concealed, Paul said, is now revealed. Yea, the deep things of God. His eternal purpose is revealed by what is written. It's in the Bible. In the Bible. But that's a journey. But there are people, see, that feel they have no hope in this life. You know, I've told the story, you know, about me and John and our growing up. You know, our mom, all depressed and alcoholic and, and a violent husband, my dad, you know, beat her up. He'd drinking. And she decides one day she had about enough of that. So she just calmly keeps me up with her, talking with me. Didn't normally keep me up at six years old to talk to me then sends me to bed so she can take her gun out and shoot herself in the head. That's somebody who didn't have any hope. Couldn't see it anyway, couldn't find it. I don't believe that there's anybody left on this planet that has to feel they have no hope. you got examples in the Bible of God sending people and crossing paths over great distances. Cornelius comes to mind, devout, praying to God, feared God, gave much alms to God's people. He's Gentile. He's a Gentile. He puts, sends an angel to his house, tells him, you need to send down here to Joppa and get this here, go to the house of Simon the Tanner and get this Simon Peter guy. He'll come back here and tell you words by which you and your house will be saved. Direct intervention, divine intervention, crossing paths. You see the same thing in Acts 8 with Philip and the eunuch. Sending a, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch on his way back from Jerusalem, bent up to worship, looking in the scripture, can't understand Isaiah, what we would call Isaiah 53, chapter 53, about one being led as a lamb to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shears opened on his mouth and taken his life 
He's killed. And the man said, he don't know who this is he's talking about. Angel of the Lord directs Philip down there to join himself to that chariot over probably four-day distance. Philip comes alongside the chariot and says, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I let somebody guide me? So why don't Philip come up here and sit in the chariot? Show him the place of the scripture. He goes, who's he talking about? Himself or somebody else? Philip began at the same verse to preach Jesus to him. As they went on their way, saw some water. He said, hey, here's water. What hinders me from being immersed? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He said, I believe Jesus Christ, Son of God. Whoop, stopped the chariot. Got down, went into the water. Laid him down in there. Then he come up, both come up out of the water. Spirit of the Lord took Philip away. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Crossing paths over great distances. I've told the story, you know, Aaron Knotts, I mean, that to me is a God sighting. Met him in Bali, Indonesia. Go look at that on the map and see where that's at. Down there in the middle of the Indian Ocean somewhere, a little speck. He's from New Zealand. I was from the United States of America. He's the first guy me and Benoit ran into when we got to the seminar, the Asian Mission Forum, in Bali, Indonesia, we were late coming out of Singapore. Flight was delayed. We get there late, show up, walk in the room, big room, tables and chairs all set up. People had their stuff on there. Nobody in the room at all except one guy. Aaron Knotts from New Zealand. I said, hey, where's everybody at? He said, they're over in the dining hall eating. He said, where are you guys from? I said, he's from India, I'm from the States. He said, I'm from New Zealand. I said, oh yeah? He said, man, he said, everything came together for me to be here. He said, everything, the plans fell completely through. He said, God must have wanted me to be here for a reason. You know, um, he said, I'm real anxious to, to, to be here. And I could use the encouragement. And I, I said, well, I got some things I could share with you. You might find it be encouraging. He said, brother, if you got it, I'm ready to listen. You know, we immersed Aaron in the ocean. I did, right before we got on the bus to leave. I mean, his eyeballs popped wide open. I mean, is that a coincidence when that kind of stuff happens? So when I was in Kosovo, I was told there was a woman. She was a preacher's wife, a small church, some, I don't even know, some denomination of some sort, Christian denomination church, and I heard that she had access to a group of women, 300 she's directly involved with, and they are these victims. She was willing to meet with me. We met, and her story was very interesting. She said, one of the things that compels me to do this, that I must do this to help these women, her. She said, because by, by the, for the grace of God, I was to be one of those victims. And she wasn't. But she realized how close she came. So she feels compelled to want to help them. And she gets them like a, maybe a sewing machine, some chickens. They need some water wells. Now, I see what she's trying to do. She's showing a kindness to them. One of the things she said, which was kind of interesting, when she met the person, the woman, that would be able to connect her, the woman looked at her and said, who are you and why do you want to help? She said, are you a church? Now see, this woman, she said, you can call me Becky. I cannot pronounce her Albanian name real well, but if you Englishized it, it would be Becky. And she knew, I almost hate to say this, we got kids in here. Some of those Serbs carved a cross in their body. Javid showed me the pictures of bloody crosses on the walls. 
of homes where they had killed the people and put the cross because these were Serbian Orthodox that did that. So that cross is a symbol to these women. It's an abomination. It's horror to them to see this cross. So that woman asked her, she said, are you a church? Because Becky knew this is the moment of truth. If I tell them, yes, I'm with a church, she feared the woman say, you get away from us. You stay away from us. She said, yes, I am a church, from a church. And the woman said, I will work with you. And Becky said, why? And the woman said, because I trust you. Because the woman was a believer. When I say a believer, I'm, I have no idea what their, their true faith or understanding is. They're a believer in God, or Jesus Christ specifically. So because she was talking about what she tries to do, I said, well, how do, how do you do this without others who coming to realize these women that you're working with, that would mean that they're these victims. She said, no, they wouldn't know. And she explained, it'd be like what, when we're working with Olga Goncharenko in Belarus. Olga just helps all kinds of people, you know, with all the basic needs, human needs that people have. So this woman just simply is like working with the family. They're generally poor. They got issues, you know, stuff like that. So she can move amongst that population without anybody really figuring out. Because she doesn't tell people I'm only ministering to victims of that atrocity. So I thought, okay, yeah, that's cool. I see that. Because, you know, we go with Olga, we help and all that stuff, and nobody's the wiser. She said, we had one meeting with this group. We brought a psychologist from America. And she said, it, it went good. You know, people appreciated that. And I'm ready to come right out of my skin. And so I got on a roll. I said, oh, you know, you know, this is really, you know, we really got to unpackage the gospel here. You know, people don't realize, I said, the power of the gospel to open our minds, open our understanding that the bad things that have happened can be overwhelmed by the light of the, the gospel, that God can uh, do that through the transformation and the renewing of the mind. I'm just giving you a kind of a, I mean, I didn't go completely out of my skin, but she's looking at me. And she was smiling. She was smiling from ear to ear. Just like she would tell Alexandra Elam later. She said, when Steve was talking, I felt like I knew him all my life. She was hearing what I was saying. I see the Lord, see, when Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice, there's just something about the gospel. When it's unpackaged, rightly divided, book, chapter, verse, it is a message of hope. It comes through loud and clear. A message of hope, a chance, a new beginning, awesome. It, it just makes sense. And people can hear it. And she was listening. I really believe, this is just, you know, some of us were talking in our first hour. You know, you see in the scripture, God working behind the scenes to make things happen. And I've shared some stories, you know, did it down here at family camp, or at the camp we had, yeah, to, in August. And there was actually guys in the room that were witnesses of what I was saying. Matt Hartford was, Tom Tuck was, of things that happened, how God worked almost immediately to make things happen it shouldn't have happened. I mean, it wasn't just coincidence. I'll tell you what, if that's just my luck, then I'm going to buy a lot of tickets. <laughs> because I've had quite a few of these God sightings that there is no other explanation for how that, that happened so fast and the result of it. I look at this situation with this population uh, is truly... God working because I know of no other power on the face of this earth to take people that have suffered 
in that way and give them joy, fill them, all joy and all peace, and that they can abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if this is only for middle class white Americans, if, if the gospel is only for those that pretty much got their stuff together anyway, not going to be lacking too much, or too much of a disability or trauma that has happened to them in their life, I don't believe God looks down and says, oh, man, oh, I can't believe I just had that guy. Lord, help me. Uh, sorry, buddy. I don't think anybody can help you. Man, whoa. I think that's when God shines. That's when the gospel shines. When it can take the likes of some human being that has had everything blow up. I mean, Job does come to mind. You know what Job said? My worst nightmares happened to me. Think about what he lost. He lost all his kids. He didn't lose one or two. You know, if you got a bunch of kids and you lose one or two, I think you'd still be kind of greed, bummed out about the whole thing. He lost all ten in one afternoon. All his stuff, all his flocks, all his herds, all that he possessed, then boom, lost his health. Most people fear hearing the C word. Uh-oh, you know, we worry about our health. You realize those three things Job had done to him, two in one day, and then later the health thing, but if you keep reading, he had a whole lot more going on than that. His own wife thought he had bad breath. Uh, and he became the song of the drunkards, you know, singing in the clubs, you know, mocking Job. I mean, everybody forsook him. His three good buddies kept trying to tell him that he had sinned, done wrong, and he probably would get what he deserved. And he said, I didn't do nothing. Oh, now you're proud. Oh, yeah, right. You think you're the only righteous one down here, Joe Baru? Everybody was against him. There's one at scripture that indicates how long it was. It was months. I always wondered about that. How long did he go through that? I could show you that. Months. He was reflecting on the months past, it says, when things were fine. God could allow all that because he, you know, he did restore Job. Number one, his t he, it was ten kids. It doesn't say. I'm sure it wasn't the same ones. Uh, and twice over his possessions, things were restored. God can allow the things that happen because the light is greater, but the light has to be unpackaged. The darkness is easy to see. It just, I can't accept this fact, uh, but it's true all over the world. I know I'm talking about Kosovo right now, but that is not, no more different than any other place in this crazy, mixed up world. It's a human thing. And everybody, I don't minimize anybody's trials. Maybe I didn't have that particular trial, but I'd never minimize theirs, and they haven't had mine. But they, nobody skates. This is serious stuff. This is not bad hair days. I mean, really seriously, even people that seem to have it all. I mean, I don't know. Maybe this is not a great example, but I know for a lot of people, they were shocked when Robin Williams killed himself. People were wondering, what the heck was wrong with him? Man, he's a funny guy. Do you ever realize that that humor was a defense, a protection? Something he hid behind because there was something going on inside the guy. Obviously, it was more than he could take or more than he could bear, and I guess he felt he had no hope, so he killed himself. I'd never minimize just because you live in halfway decent digs and, you know, good job, money, friends, whatever you want, and then that doesn't mean that's all that's going on in your life. 
Because the things that affect the people happen deep down inside, in their core, and they're up where the gospel light needs to shine. Everybody has this deficit, this emptiness, this, this itch they can't scratch. They, they try everything to try to find relief. Sometimes they try everything but God. I know what I need. I need another spouse. That's what I need. I, I need a better job. I need more money, honey. I need to move to Arizona. Oh, I'm sure that'll fix it. Everybody's got these things going on. They'll try everything but God, except as a last resort. I hate to say it, but sometimes, I mean, we're thick, man. We're stubborn, dip, nick. But God knows he's a good father. He cares about everybody, not willing that any should perish, the Bible says. I really hope I'll be able to not only minister to Phil and that family, Javid is besides himself. He said, I'm losing my mind. Because Leva was their little angel. She was the first grandchild. She's a cutie. And the thought of her, it's sad to watch her try. She walks, but her step, her gait is, you can see, she struggles. And if she go, gets down, she, she struggles to get up. She sometimes needs help. She doesn't know why she can't run like the other children are running like she used to. She can't figure it out. So it's a painful thing to watch. Uh, and if it's the severe kind of that dystrophy, because we go to another family, uh, Blarina met her when we did the wheelchair project in Kosovo with Handicoss. And when I first met Blarina and we gave her a new chair, because I, when I met her, she was in a wheelchair. But she could motor it with her own power, you know, and she would make it go. But now that ain't, ain't happening. And she's gone downhill so fast, and now she can't talk. She struggles to swallow. And I asked Gillier about her, and he says, she will die, Mr. Steve. I just pray it won't, she won't suffer too much. And I know if they're thinking about Leva going through that. I know. But this other group of people, I just will be praying about that, and maybe you could too, because if this opens up and Avni translates all those books, you know, I think it may be a while before a group of women might want to see male ministers, you know, coming around to, to do whatever. God knows. I mean, women first, maybe. But the books certainly could be introduced into the population and if it's in their language. And, you know, uh, Avni, one of the great things about Avni is he really understands the nuances and all that of the English language. He will be able to take very clearly the way Jay put those things down because Jay is very smart, but he's able to bring it down you know, to the common level to make those points very clear, that Avni would be able to do the exact same thing. So introducing those books into the population, they could be freely given, especially about the transformation of the renewing of the mind, the power of a new creation, the power of the cleansing of the inside of the cup in order to go through that transformation process so that we can, they can have the joy and peace and believing and abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's divine. They're made for it. It's the plan. Plan A. There is no plan B. It always was plan A. It's for them. It's for us. It's for all people for all time. You know, as we're going through the book of the Revelation study, I know the ladies are, we are too. But, you know, I really appreciate the way Hendrickson brought out those things. That, number one, the, the whole purpose of that book was to help the early church understand the dynamic of what they're involved in and to have comfort through unbelievable trials. Things that first are shown in the first, what, chapters 1 through 11 that happen basically how what affects the earth affects us. We're all part of it earthquakes and war and all that kind of stuff, famine and pestilence and 
you know, it's his disease. It's always been like that. Is it like that right now? Oh, yeah. How about that Dorian that just went cruising by? Man, you take a look at the Bahamas. Can you even imagine days of 185 mile an hour sustained winds? Man, alive. I'll bet the people there thought, this is the end of the world. I mean, for sure. I can't even imagine the terror that they had while they were clinging to anything until it finally killed them. They're, they're finding more and more. I mean, the death toll is going to probably be way more than anybody even thought. They haven't begun to get through that rubble. So, that just recently, but I think the thing is still going on, crawling up the East Coast, whatever, not at that speed, but... And then he gives us the insight, you know, chapters 12 through 22, from what's going on behind the scenes in heaven or in the spiritual realm. You know, Paul said we need to armor up. We need to put on the whole armor of God in order to stand the evil day and have done all the stand. We've got to put on that armor because we're not fighting flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, a spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. There's your reality for you. That's why these horrors, like the things that I described, that, you know, this is just Kosovo's turn, man, because this stuff been going on forever. Genocide, you can go to memorials all over the place where wholesale, when, Je when uh, Victor uh, uh, Yashnikov was walking me through one of the big parks that I like there in Belarus, he told me, yeah, back here there's mass graves. Because, you know, Belarus, uh, Minsk was destroyed by the Nazis. I think there were six buildings standing, totally flattened by the Germans, the Nazis. And so when Victor told me about the mass graves in the back of the park here, I said, what, the, the Germans did that, the Nazis? He said, no, Stalin, their own president of Russia, Soviet Union, Stalin, Joseph Stalin, some say 40 million, some say 60 million people disappeared. Hey, what? You know, that wasn't two or 3,000 years ago. Many people walking around here were alive. <laughs> it's in our generation, our times, what I'm saying. And that happened all over Europe. The darkness in this world is incredible. And the hope of the world is still and always will be the gospel, the good news. Man, we got to get our heads wrapped around what we're going through. Otherwise, we'll get all caught up in life and, you know, and so busy about so many things. We're going to miss the big picture. We're going to miss what's going on. We're going to run into somebody that's going to tell you a story that they've been through something like that and your jaw's going to drop. What are you going to tell them? Jesus loves you? Yeah, right. You think that? Well, you need to go to church on Sunday. Are you going to tell somebody that's been through that that that'll help them? Don't even think that that's going to work. It's the truth that sets free, not going to church on Sunday. We get to assemble. But some people assemble all over the place, but it's not in the truth, though. It's just social. It's just church. I told you this before. When Jabba Duraco showed me the pictures of the bloody crosses on the walls, he was telling me how the Christians came in and did that and cut the people's heads off. And I said, Jabba, those weren't Christians. And he looked at me and he said, yes, Mr. Steve. He wasn't arguing. He was just stating it as a fact. Of course they were. Because it's the only Christianity he ever heard of. Roman Catholicism or Russian Orthodox, which is the first split off Roman, the Roman church, is Eastern Orthodoxy. And they adopted most of their liturgy and their various practices and all that stuff. So Javid is telling me, matter of factly, the Christians went in there and did that to them people. And I said, it wasn't Christian. Avni said that's the only Christianity he ever knew was Catholicism or Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. When Avni came here and saw simple Christianity, 
and he saw it at Wasion, he saw it at Lima, he saw it at Everett, Pennsylvania, and he saw it here. He said, Stevie, explain this to me. Where's like the big headquarters? I said, there's not. It's in heaven. He said, well, is Mike over you, speaking of Mike Harbor, or are you over Jeremy Wilson? How's that work? I said, no, in the Bible, all the churches were autonomous, self-rule. They had elders, deacons, you know, preachers, you know, their local, local congregation. But I said, but they all had the same information, same book. They all believed the same thing. He said, oh, Stevie, I like this. He said, I like this. Because he told me he went to a Catholic church in Pristina, he said, I'd sit there and I'd try to listen to what they were saying. He'd say something, the people would respond. He'd say something, they'd responded back. You know, it looked real religious. He said, but I walked out of there and I wondered, he said, what did I get out of that? He couldn't figure it out. But I'll tell you what, when he saw the scriptures opened up, line upon line, precept upon precept, and he saw the simplicity and the power of the gospel, he said, I like this. My sheep, Jesus said, will hear my voice. It's just amazing to me how some people can hear it like that. And some people, you couldn't convince them. Jesus could not convince the Jews. Think about this. Jesus is Jewish. The Jews had the true covenant with the creator, and they had the first written and only written code from God was given to the descendants of Abraham, specifically, and we understand, the Jews, the Hebrew. Even though they want to ignore their scriptures that say that the message is going to be for all people for all time for the Gentiles. They don't like to talk about that. So here comes Jesus of Nazareth. He's Jewish from the tribe of Judah. It didn't take long when his revealing came after his baptism in the Jordan River and the Jews started to realize, who's he? Say what? They didn't like him. They didn't like him at all. The people did. Oh, the common people heard him gladly. They were very attentive to his words. But the chief priests and scribes and the Pharisees, for the most part, not all of them, hated him. Hated his words. They believed in Moses. We trust in Moses. Who this guy? We don't know where he's from. He's a sinner. Blind guy said, well, where is this a sinner or not? I don't know. I know one thing. I'll blind now I can see. And there have been heard of that a, a sinner, a, a open eyes of a blind man before. They were divided. So the most religious people on the face of the earth despised him and hated him. His own people and killed him. Go Go figure that out. Jesus told me, your father's the devil. There's a lot of things being taught and shared out there. It's the truth that will set you free. The truth is in this here book, by the way. Scripture, Jesus said, that cannot be broken. It can bring a person out of that darkness into the marvelous light. They can have hope again. They can have peace. They can be filled with joy and peace. Imagine that. Imagine being filled. I mean, all of us would like a little bit of peace, a little bit of joy. How about being filled? filled with it and it's by divine assistance it's from the creator we're not out here blowing sunshine up people's noses i never forget that when i was watching one time it was after that sandy hook massacre where that crazy guy went in there and shot them little kids in the head in that school i can't even imagine they were the little ones that he would do that and i remember the whole nation was reeling and I remember I was watching uh, Fox News. I was watching Hannity, and he had Father John, Jonathan, and Holstein, whatever that guy's from out there. <clears throat> the Protestant guy and the Catholic guy. And Sean looked at them and said, you guys got to give us some hope here, man. What is this? How do you explain this? America is waiting, Sean said, to hear and them two look like the deer in the headlights, both of them. The Catholic priest had no answers. You know, they start mumbling these bumper sticker slogans or these things, you know, platitude. Trust in God, God's mysterious ways. I think, oh, spare me. 
and Holstein couldn't do any better. They mumbled this and that, had no answers for the country. I, I had all kinds of scriptures popping into my head, you know, to talk about the darkness and the evil and the evil that's in the hearts of man and how it takes the power of Almighty God, the divine influence, to bring about a new birth through a born-again process where a person can put off concerning their former conduct. They can be renewed in the spirit of the mind, that they can put on the new man created by God in true righteousness and holiness to overcome the darkness of this world. It's never going to go away. That's what it is. That's how it manifests on the earth. But few will find it, Jesus said. Few. But ain't nobody going to find it if somebody don't know. How can they hear without a preacher? How can they preach that except they be sent? How blessed are the feet of the, those who go and preach the gospel of good news. We're it. The church is it. It's been given to the church. God ain't coming down here to preach it again. Jesus ain't coming back to preach except in the context of preaching it for through you. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. It isn't I who live, but Christ lives in me. It's Jesus who dwells in us. The mystery, Paul said, in 1 Corinthians 1.27, is Christ is in you, the hope of glory. We have the same message he had. We have a human body, but it's indwelt by the power of the Holy Spirit, as his was. I mean, we're it. We're the ones to, that Christ is to be manifested in our mortal flesh to this world with the same message. And the same mission, go and seek and save that which is lost. Go into all the world, preach good news to them. Man, if we don't do it, who is? When Mordecai told Esther, he said, Look, man, all the Jews are going to be killed in one day. She's married, obviously, to the Persian king. He doesn't know she's Jewish. But that word was put out by his signet, his decree, to kill all the Jews in one day. Mordecai said, you got to do something. you got to go in and talk to him. She said, he hasn't summoned me. And if I go in there unsummoned, I could be put to death instantly for that. He said, well, look, how do you know you weren't raised up for this very purpose right now? And if you don't do it, deliverance is going to come. And if it's not going to be through you, it'll be through somebody else. God will do it. So he said, you go tell the people to fast. And I'm going in there. And if I die, I die. And when you get a chance and you see, it's a good movie how they put that together to make you understand the brevity of scripture sometimes makes you think, some people might think, well, how could she be in danger? She was his wife. How do you think he's going to kill her? <laughs> the eunuch told her flat out, this isn't the man's bedroom. It's the culture. And it was a threat against her. It was real. As it is for us right now today. The gospel's being opposed all over the world. And you do sometimes. You'll take a risk when you go out and open your mouth but look, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Who's going to give the people the hope? How can they find the joy and peace in believing? You know, if you don't do it, I don't do it, God will raise up somebody to do it, even if you have to bring them all the way from the other side of the planet to do it and drop them like a smart bomb right in their SUV. Thanks for your attention.